Well, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We don't get to say that often, right? Happy Mother's Day. The story is told of a mother who was a working mother, but I, 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 I understand every mother is a working mother. Some work in the house and some work outside the house too. But all mothers are working mothers. And uh, we, we cannot thank you enough. But the story says that this working mother was at her job site when she received a call from the babysitter. And the call from the babysitter said that she needed to get back with medicine because her baby was sick. And you know, mothers, you know how it is when your baby is sick and you are not there. She went to the pharmacy right away to get the medicine required. And as she came out of the pharmacy, tried to get into her car, he realized one thing. That the keys were inside the car. So now she's worried. She doesn't know what to do. So the first thing she does is that she calls her husband. Her husband was working far away, so he could not come back quickly. So he said, look for a clothes hanger. You know that technique? Okay, you know it. Okay. So she looked for some kind of wire on the floor, and she found an old rusted piece of hanger that probably the last victim had used. And she picked it up, and then when she picked it up, she went to the window and said, well, I don't know what to do. And she prayed, God, guide me, help me what to do. I need to get back to my baby. In that moment, the sound of a motorcycle was approaching. And on the motorcycle was a man, tall, long hair, long beard, big arms, no sleeves, leather vest. You know who I'm talking about? And in a deep voice, she said, how can I help you? And she said, you know, I need to open my car. My kids are inside. I need to go to, to the house. My baby's sick and I have his medicine. And he said, sure. The man grabbed the wire. And with tranquility and experience as somebody who's done it before, <laughs> slide the wire through the window, pulled it up, and the lock popped. Right there. This young mother turned to the man, hugged him, and said, thank you, you're such a good man. And the man looking down at the woman said, well, I'm not that good. I came out of prison two years ago for Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> then she turned around and said, God, thank you, because you even sent me a professional. <laughs> but the truth. The truth is that there's no group of people praying as much as mothers do. There's nothing like the prayer of a mother, especially when a child is not doing well. The story that we'll visit today is when the disciples realized that they needed to be taught to pray. And isn't it true that it's mothers who often teach children how to pray? Come with me uh, to your notes or to the Bible. Let's go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verse 1. Luke, chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. Now, it is interesting to see that the disciples, at, le at least this one, didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to make miracles. Didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to multiply bread and fish. Didn't ask Jesus to teach them how to heal blind people. Or not even ask them to teach them how to walk on water. That would have been cool. But that is not what the disciple asked. I believe that the reason why that was not 
the petition was because the disciples had already realized that everything that Jesus did was because of his time praying. The disciples had discovered that the power that engulfed Jesus in his ministry was drawn through the power of prayer. But we have to clear some misunderstandings about prayer. See, oftentimes we pray out of guilt. I haven't done it in a long time. The pastor is preaching a series on prayer. I got to pray at least one minute out of the five that he has. Oftentimes, we don't pray out of guilt, but we pray out of duty. I have to pray. I must pray. I'm a Christian. The least thing I can do is pray. And, and it's funny because there's prayers that are always the same when we pray them. The only difference is the meal in front of us. Oftentimes, the only difference in our prayer is just the time we go to bed. But the prayer is the same. We create patterns. But see, prayer is not repetition. In fact, prayer is not a religious act. And the reason why oftentimes we miss the point of prayer is because we miss. We don't understand. Or we don't even know. The purpose of prayer. And everything that exists, when we don't use it according to its purpose, we tend to abuse it and misuse it. So this morning, we'll, we'll try to discover the purposes of prayer. Now, the first purpose of prayer is that prayer is an act of dedication. Prayer is an act of dedication. It's an opportunity to practice, to practice devotion, to practice dependency. You see, you've seen a, when in front of the church, a young family has a baby, and the baby is brought up to be dedicated, correct? And we take that practice from the moment when Jesus was dedicated in the temple in Jerusalem. We must understand that the, the parents... Mary and Joseph, they already know who Jesus was. They were told by the angel who Jesus was going to be. In fact, they needed to be dedicated as parents to, to do the right thing with Jesus. But they did something special and unique. They brought Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. In other words, that from that moment on, through the rest of his life, Jesus would be in communication with the Father. And the way Jesus was going to learn that was by observing Mary and Joseph. Prayer is an opportunity to be dedicated to a task. That's why it's an, it is an act of dedication. I don't know if, if uh, in, in the job that you, that, that you do, some of you work in, in, in factories, some of you work in, 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 on the road, some of you work in an office or at school or in a hospital, a clinic, some of you work in different, different places. And, and it's interesting to know that you can tell, regardless of the job that you do, who is dedicated to the job and who's not. Especially if you are in charge, especially if you're a manager or, or uh, somebody in charge. You know who's dedicated to the job. In fact, you have workers come into your house to do different tasks. And there's some that you would hire back and some that you wouldn't. Because you know how dedicated they were to their job. Dedication trains us to be better. You remember a, a basketball player by the name of Kobe Bryant? There's a story about him. There's many stories about him, but there's one story in particular that caught my attention. It is said that in the last Olympics, when he played, they had a game the following night, but the night before, 
Kobe Bryant did not go to sleep. According to the story, the trainer who was in charge of the team realized that Kobe was not in his room. And he thought the only place that Kobe might be, listen, the only place that Kobe might be is at the gym. So he went to the practice facility, and there in the practice facility, Kobe Bryant was shooting three-pointers. And he said, Kobe, I don't know if you know, but it's three in the morning. And he says, yes, I know, but I still have 3,000 more shots to shoot. It was three in the morning. If that is not dedication, I don't know what is. What do you do those times that you can't sleep? You know, it's a beautiful thing to pray at night when you can't sleep. That's the best time to fall asleep when you're praying. Seriously, if you can't sleep, I tell you, those of you with insomnia, pray. Pray. If you fall asleep while I'm preaching, you fall asleep when you're praying. <laughs> trust me. Trust me. And it's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing to fall asleep while you are praying. Because you know you're falling asleep in the arms of Jesus. Now, when we talk of prayer about being an act of dedication, it teaches us humility. Because see, the moment that I pray... That I pray for, for a need for me or for my family or for someone else. What I'm saying is, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. Because see, the only one reason why we don't pray is pride. Oh, I, I don't need it. I don't need it. It's like the deacon who came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you know, they had a problem in the church. And, and, and when the deacon came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you know, we tried everything and, and nothing works. The only thing that we have left is prayer. And, and oftentimes that is the way we think, that prayer is the last resource, but in reality it should be the first. Our first choice, our first go-to thing is prayer. Because when we begin to pray, it's the moment that we say, God, we need you. I can't do it on my own. But our pride oftentimes is the obstacle that impedes us to pray. Because we think we still got it. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing, nothing. A long time ago, I was reading an article on uh, the way divers in the past Explore the depths of the ocean. And there was a time when they invented something called the diving bell. The diving bell. I think we have a picture of it. This device was designed with one purpose. To allow men to walk on the bottom of the ocean. Now this is the early, one of those early designs. But we have modern ones. And you see the modern one... It has lights and everything is sophisticated. But see, in order for someone to walk on the bottom of the ocean, even if it was in the early times at the beginning of the century or, or now, the modern diving bell and the ancient diving bell have one thing in common. In fact, all the diving bells have one thing in common. There is one hose of air... That goes from the top where the boat is to the bottom where the diver is walking on the ground. The moment when that hose is blocked, cut, obstructed, the diver dies. That hose is a lifeline for that diver. I think that prayer is our hose. And we cannot live completely on this planet unless we depend on the power of prayer. That is why prayer is an act of dedication. We cannot be without it for a minute, for an hour, for a day. 
The second thing we need to learn is that prayer is an act of communication. It's an act of communication. In the same chapter of John, verse 15, it says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servants do not know what his master is doing. But I have called you. Are you breathing this morning? Friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now, what does it take for somebody to be your friend on Facebook? What does it take for somebody to be your follower on Instagram? How does it take for you to make Jesus your friend? See, there is an interesting principle about this because our greatest problem, our greatest problem is not that we don't love God. Our greatest problem is that we don't understand how much God loves us. Amen. See, l- let me share with you this, this quote from, from, from L. G. White. Can, can we put it up there? Can you read it? Behold the Son of God bowed in prayer to his Father. Though he is the Son of God, he strengthens his faith by prayer. We're talking about Jesus here. He strengthened his faith by prayer. And by communion with the heavens, gathered to himself power to resist evil, and to minister to the needs of men. You see that everything that Jesus did in his own persona and with others depended on his practice of prayer, on communication with the Father. But see, we talked, we talk to the people who we love. The more we love a person, the more we talk to that person. See, uh, when I began to date my wife, it was before the times where cell phones went around. Yes, there was a time where there were no cell phones. There was no texting, believe it or not. And, And the phones back then had a cord. Do you remember that? The young people were like, really, what? My my parents had a phone in the living room, and... I, I didn't have a phone in my room, so we had a long cord, one of those coil cords. Remember those? And you stretch it so far, and then it never came back right again. So I had to, to take the phone under the door, and, and I was talking to my girlfriend. And it was getting late, often. But we were talking, and then we got to the point where, well, we have to say Bye. Well, you first. No, you first. <laughs> you remember that? No, no, you first. Okay, I love you. I love you more. No, I love you more. What was the reason why we didn't want to hang up? Because we loved each other. And when you love a person, you want to communicate with that person. Why is it that when when we get mad with somebody, we don't want to talk to them? But when we love a person, the one thing we want to do is to talk to them. See, our problem is not that we don't love God. It's that we don't understand how much He loves us. And He loves us so much that He's always waiting for us to pick up the phone At least send a text. I believe that there's no bad prayer. The only bad prayer is the one that we don't pray. Any prayer is a good prayer. Any communication with God is good. See, there's not a formula for a right prayer. Because the best prayers are the ones that are prayer on the spot. The prayers that we don't practice, the prayers that we don't rehearse, the prayers that come out of our sheer need of God at any particular moment, those are the best prayers. So see, prayer is an act of communication. And also prayer is an act of petition. 
Philippians 4, 6, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication is a fancy word for asking. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, this is the most popular purpose of prayer. In fact, oftentimes our prayer it only consists of petition. The question is, are we asking the right way? John 16, verse 24 says, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Now, the Bible teaches a couple of things about this. And the first thing that it teaches is that there are some things that are only provided to us through prayer. There are things that only happen after prayer. You do remember the story when, the, when Jesus was up on the mound with three of the disciples, and the rest of the disciples were at the foothill. And, and a father came with his son with an illness, and, and the disciples said, well, we, we just came back from doing all kinds of miracles, so yeah, yeah, bring him over. And they tried to heal this young man, but nothing was happening. After their frustrated efforts, Jesus comes down and says, guys, this kind, this kind can only be fixed by prayer. You remember that story? Because there are things that only happen after prayer. That's one thing that the Bible teaches. Another thing is that prayer is an attitude. It's an attitude. Oftentimes the way we pray changes from, the, from place to place. Not from person to person. Because it could be the same person, but if it's in one place, the prayer is different than in another place. I'll give you an example. The way you pray in your home is very different than when you're asked to pray here at church. Oftentimes, our prayers here at church are planned, practiced, rehearsed. Funny thing, the Spirit of Prophecy says that praying long prayers in public, it's a sign of no prayer in private. Because the prayers that we pray in private come out of the heart. We don't practice. We just pray. So prayer, the Bible teaches, is an attitude. Psalm 37, 4. Look. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. Let me explain this text to you. The way we read it and the way we want to understand it is that, oh, whatever I pray, God is going to give to me. Right? That's the way we read it. But no, no. He's saying that God will give you the desires of your heart. So whatever your heart will want when you pray, God will give you that desire. Are you with me? So when I pray, God is going to mold my needs, my heart, my mind, my relationship with Him to a point that what I need is what He wants me to need. What I long for is what God wants me to long for. My desires will become His desires. Because prayer is an attitude. Not that I deserve, but that I need you, God. And Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he without withhold from those who walk upright. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk upright. Now, Walking upright doesn't mean that 
if you're a little hunchback, you're not going to get it. It means that you constantly are looking up. That you constantly are looking for His guidance, for His words, for His wisdom. David speaks a lot of seeking God in the morning and at night. That constancy, that dependency leads into a prayer, a petition according to the, to the heart of God. See, we have to understand this. God is omnipresent. And that means that He is everywhere. He is everywhere. And not just everywhere, but at all times. He's omnipresent. So there is nothing that you do, that you need, that you might pray for, that is away from the knowledge of God. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. God is all-powerful. He can do everything. So see, there's nothing that I can pray for that God cannot do. There's nothing that I can tell God that He doesn't know. And there's no situation where God hasn't been there. So then why do I have to pray? That is the question. If He knows everything, why do I have to pray? See, prayer, yeah, prayer is not for God. Prayer is to change us. See, it's not like one day you're, you go to pray and as you're telling God things, He goes, oh, really? I didn't know that. Wow, I, I missed that one totally. No, God is never going to say that because He's aware of everything. It's not for Him. It's for us. It's for us. So that we can have this attitude of dependency, of communication, of petition. Luke eleven eleven says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Oftentimes, my children have behaved in a way that crossed my mind. There's a story about a man who wanted to travel. He, he wanted to travel around the world, but he didn't have a lot of money. So what he did is that he saved and saved and saved and saved, and saved, and saved. And finally, he was able to buy a ticket for a cruise liner around the world. But he heard that the food was expensive abroad. So what he did is that in a luggage, he bought tuna and crackers. So every day, he left to his room, opened a can of tuna, some crackers, and eight. And as the cruise went on, day after day, week after week, the night before the end of the trip, one of the attendants at the ship came to his room, knocked on the door, and said, Sir, I'm just here to remind you that tonight is the dinner with the captain. And the man said, Well, you know, I'm just going to stay in my room. And she asked, why? Are you feeling ill? Is there something wrong? He said, no, no, no. It's because I don't think I can afford eating with the captain. And he said, oh, no. The dinner with the captain is already included in the ticket, just like where are the other meals? <laughs> and you see, this is what happens. We think that when we ask something to God, it's, it's going to be something difficult, something really hard to do, something unattainable, something that we cannot afford, something that we, we're going to have to do a sacrifice beyond our means. But no, Jesus already paid for it. That's why he says, whatever you pray, in whose name? In my name. In my name, because I already paid for it. It's already yours. It's already yours. It's right there. So the invitation, notice that, that when prayer becomes an act of petition, it's not a commandment. It's an invitation. 
because it is already there. I heard a story a long time ago of a man who, this is not theologically sound, just a story, an analogy, went to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he was shown the different places in the heavenly city. And as he comes to a building, he finds a room. And he opened the door. And when he opens the door, there's a bunch of gifts, small boxes, big boxes, all kinds. So the man asked the angel who was guiding him around the city, what are those gifts for? Who are they for? He said, oh, all those gifts have the same tag. The same tag. So this man with curiosity went into the room, grabbed one of the gifts, and read on the tag. This is a prayer that was never asked for. Remember, it's an analogy of a reality. Jesus said, as we read, you don't get anything because you haven't asked. Prayer is an act of? Prayer is an act of? Good, you woke up. Good, good, good. Also, prayer is an act of cooperation. It's an act of cooperation. See, when we pray, when we pray, we come in alliance with God. We come in unity. We, we become workmates because when I pray, His will is going to be done in my life. So we become partners. And when I pray for other people, I'm helping that person to experience the will of God in his life or her life. So prayer becomes an act of cooperation. Now this week, we're going to get a new challenge. A new challenge. You're going to get a new card. A new card. A new card. Every week we've been getting a new card. Have you been keeping up with the challenges? Okay. This week, the challenge is going to be a little bit different. Because this, this week, you are going to choose three people. Three people. Near you, far away from you, close relationships, maybe no relationship. But you, during this week, are going to pray for those three people. So you're going to write their names on the card that you get at the end, just like we do every week. And when you leave, don't forget your card. You're going to write three names of people that, to whom, for whom you are going to pray every day of this week. At least one time, one time a day. At least once. Okay? Because we want our prayers to help us, to guide us, to turn us into partners with God. We want His will to be done not just in our lives, but in the lives of other people. Okay? So it's easier than the week before, you see. Now, John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, that's a powerful promise right there. But it doesn't stop there. And it says, and greater works. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is one of those texts that in my life, in my spiritual walk, have been very difficult to accept and understand. I can't see myself walking on water very soon. Flying maybe, but walking on water? You're like, really? I'm kidding. Now, I, I don't see myself doing great in things like God. But see, we have to understand a couple of things here. First, Jesus is talking to the disciples about their time they're living in. Notice. We're going to read it again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he's speaking to the twelve, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Has Jesus ascended yet when he said these words? No. So the ascension has not occurred. 
Now, pay attention carefully because this is where the point is. Once Jesus goes to heaven, once the ascension occurs, now the gospel is being preached to the whole world. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Remember Paul said, I preach the gospel to the whole world. It's after the ascension that the expansion of the gospel increases more than at the time when Jesus was here. Jesus is not talking about quality here. He's talking about quantity. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus is saying, now you, he's talking to the disciples, and today he's talking to each one of us. Now you, you are my representatives. You are part of these prayers that are going to be answered and greater things than the ones that happened then will occur. Because now people don't have to see Jesus on the cross. Now people don't have to see the miracles of the tongues. Now Jesus can be shown to people through us. As we live our lives of prayer, as we become partners with God, people can see Jesus through us. It says verse 13, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, we don't need another name to pray. We need the name of Jesus. Oftentimes, people believe from different faiths that you could pray with other names. The funny thing is, that the name they used is the name of his mother. But if you remember that story at the wedding of Canaan, Mary went to ask Jesus to do the miracle because she was unable. So why would I speak to a middleman or a middle woman if I can go directly to the source? That is the name that we need, the name of Jesus. And we can speak directly to him today in his name. We don't need any other name. And then he says, verse 14, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. But what does it mean to ask things in his name? It's not a formula in Jesus' name. It's not a formula. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. See, uh, years ago, I was assigned to another church, and uh, when I went to that church, my youngest son, I'm not going to say his name, <laughs> began to run in the church between services, and as he was running, one of the deacons stopped him and said, you can't run in the church. My son looked at him and said, my dad is a pastor. You know what? My dad is the creator of this universe. My dad loves me so much that he wants to be part of my life. He is interested in my family. He is interested in my finances. He is interested in my marriage. He is interested in my health. He is interested in my children. He is interested in everything that I'm part of because he loves me and he wants me to have him in every area of my life. But oftentimes we miss it because we miss the relationship. See, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you a picture of a, of, of a man who... Um, uh, in, in 1993, Bill Knox demonstrated how to play bowling blindfolded. And let me tell you what he did. If you've ever been to a bowling alley, you realize that there's a line called the foul line. And you know you're in the foul line because it gets very slippery if you pass it. But what he did is that he, played, he, he placed a... Uh, a veil, a curtain, right at the foul line. And he wanted to demonstrate that it is possible to, to play bowling just by looking at the spots on the floor. That you don't need to see the pins up ahead. So what he did is that he played what he called a spot 
bowling. So with the veil in front of him, he looked at the floor and threw the ball. Is that how you call it? Throwing the ball? Rolled the ball? Launched? <laughs> ejected? Directed? Released? Whatever. I read the thesaurus the other day. So as, as he was playing, he was not looking at the pins. He only kept his eyes on the floor. And guess what? He shot 300 in 1933, demonstrating that you don't have to look ahead of the target. All you have to do is at the target in front of you, close to you. Now, in case you haven't seen it yet, oftentimes our prayer life lacks because we look at the far ahead, at the future far ahead, at the things that are away from us, and we miss whatever is in front of our eyes. And the easy things are in front of us. The simple things are in front of us. The everyday things are in front of us. And when those simple things become part of our lives, because see, we only pray for the difficult things, not for the easy things. So God is not part of every area of our life. And when the things get difficult, well, we don't know Him. We can't say, He is my dad. Because He hasn't been part of our lives in the simple things. So family, the challenge today is that we see the simple things of life, the easy things, the close things, because that will prepare us for the long haul, for the difficult ones, for the very challenging things. When we see close with God, we'll be able to see long and far away with Him. So that can prayer can become a real thing in our lives. An act of dedication, an act of communication, an act of petition, and an act of cooperation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we have to ask you forgiveness. Because in so many times we have neglected to bring you as part of our lives. In so many opportunities, Lord, when we thought that we could do it on our own, we, we never bothered to include you. But today, Lord, we understand that the reality of our needs, that the reality of our life here on earth and in heaven, it depends on our relationship with you. So through prayer, just like Jesus did, Help us to understand you in such a way that we can say, you are our Father. And in that way, honor the sacrifice you've done for us on the cross. Because it is through Jesus that we can become one. We want to be the branches that make, that make everything alive again. We ask these things in the power of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.